CNN today. Why? Well, God knows they need the help. Trump thinks presidents have near total power. There will be little to stop him in his second term. This article touches on something that I've been wondering about. Is it worth worrying about Trump? Should you be worried about him? Obviously, some people are. They really, really, really care that Trump has been elected and they're very worried. They're very scared. Is it worth being super scared about? I don't think so. But I'm curious to see why somebody might reasonably be very occupied, take up all of their attention, all of their limited resources of mental acuity to focus on who the president is. Donald Trump believes presidents have absolute, almost, absolute power. In his second term, there will be a few political or legal restraints to check him. Now, here's the thing. Let's assume that Donald Trump actually does believe that presidents have absolute power. 100% absolute power. There's no limits on what a president can do whatsoever. A... Congratulations for developing telepathy. You really need to tell us how you did that. I'm incredibly curious how you were able to look inside the mind of another human being and pull out their deep-held beliefs and thoughts. But let's assume that he did actually believe in absolute power. The entire American system of government was built on restraining tyrants, restraining the ability of anyone to effect complete control over the nation, for good or bad. Because obviously, look, a benevolent dictator is still a dictator. And if you are morally, principally opposed to any kind of absolutist, authoritarian type leader, you need to get rid of the bad with the good. So do I think Donald Trump has both the political acumen and the groundswell of support necessary to completely overturn all national conventions crafted by men? I don't think this is uh, controversial. Smarter than him. Your James Madisons, your Thomas Jeffersons, your Ben Franklins, your... John Adams, your George Washingtons, I don't think so. So, a sobering thought, cool it down, calm it down, even if he truly believed that, every system of American government is basically there to make sure that presidents don't have and cannot wield absolute power. The president elects a sweeping victory over vice president. I don't know how to. I, apparently, I pronounce her name incorrectly, so I'll just say President Harris. Suddenly, turn the theoretical notion that he will indulge his autocratic instincts into a genuine possibility. O okay. It's not like we haven't had massively increasing power in the executive branch over the last 30 years. Yeah, uh, I mean, we have, so, so that's a thing. When Trump returns to the White House in January as one of the most powerful presidents in history, 
he'll be able to take advantage of his own filleting of guardrails during his first presidency, which he continued through legal maneuverings out of office. Wow, what a political genius. It's not guaranteed that just because Trump has massive power, he will spurn constitutional checks and balances. True. His past behavior doesn't have to predict the future. But the lesson of Trump's business and political careers is that he seeks to obliterate all constraints. I don't know. He seeks to obliterate all constraints. I don't remember, I mean, Maybe I'm wrong here, but I don't remember a massive gathering of power in the executive branch under Trump. Now, this is something where I'm like, look, uh, I will absolutely happily uh, admit to being wrong if someone pre presents me with any kind of evidence on that sense. I honestly, yeah, please, please let me know. I, I don't, yeah, I'm not sure. So, yeah, go ahead and let me know. But I just don't, I don't remember it. You know, I remember maybe not sweeping away the Bush-Obama era increases in power in the executive branch. But, yeah, I don't really see massive gains that he was, you know, like, I, like what was the equivalence, like the Patriot Act under Trump? I don't remember it. He has, for instance, crushed opposition in the Republican Party and driven out political heretics who oppose his Make America Great Again creed. This will be increasingly significant since the GOP has already flipped the Senate and still hopes to complete a monopoly on Washington power by keeping the House, which CNN has not yet projected. This, is, this article is like a couple days old, so I'm not sure if CNN has projected it, but a lot of other people have. The Republicans basically have the House. It's It's... I think it's a it's a done deal on that. They have at least a, a majority of 218. No other president has come into office armed with a Supreme Court ruling that grants significant immunity to presidents for official acts. The decision, a direct result of Trump's effort to challenge his federal indictment for 2020 election meddling, is limited, but he is certain to take an expansive view of its meaning. The ruling emerged from a conservative court majority fashioned by Trump in his first term and that many legal observers now see as a rubber stamp on future power grabs. Okay, a lot in there. Firstly, you are correct. There has never been a Supreme Court ruling that grants this immunity. The immunity was always just a matter of course. It was not a point of law. It was just a normal thing uh, that every president always had immunity for all of these acts, and no one was ever challenged or brought up on any kind of charges for it. Maybe that would have changed with Nixon, but obviously he's pardoned and, you know, by Gerald Ford, and it just becomes a non-issue. But you also mentioned it's limited. It is, a, it is a limited decision, and the fact that there is now a legal framework for this means that stepping outside of those limits is much more concrete and less nebulous, and therefore, you know, the guardrails are, you know, a little bit more defined, but weaker, or, you know, stronger, but, you know, a little bit wider spaced, however you want to look at it, whatever analogy you like better. And the fact is that, okay, a president is going to take an expansive view of the uh, meaning of these court things. That's not new. Of course, he's going to do that. The onus of keeping him within the constraints of those laws is the purpose of both the legislative and judicial branch. So, that 
that's an issue. Many legal observers now see this as a rubber stamp on future power grabs. Okay. Uh, kind of, maybe, but again, you're basically just looking into a crystal ball and saying, this is definitely what's going to happen. Be worried. Not sure if that's warranted yet. Perhaps, most significantly, Trump can claim democratic legitimacy for what is already shaping up as the most intemperate presidency of the modern era. After increasing his vote share across multiple demographics, everybody knew this when they voted yesterday. So yes, the American people voted for basically this unchecked power that the president is going to have, said former Republican Adam Kinzinger, who alienated himself from his party by standing up to Trump following the January 6th, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol. It sounds like people made a value judgment and said, you know what, even if that is the case, eh, it kind of feels better than the slow creep of authoritarian that's behind closed doors and we have no, you know, We've got no hands on. We've got nothing in there. We would rather have, you know, an honest out-and-out -out dictator than someone cloaked in the shadows tyrannizing us, which I can understand. Trump tried to destroy democracy to stay in power after the 2020 election. That is quite editorialized statement. I don't believe that's been proven in a court of law, so yeah, that's just a, that's a wild statement to make. Four years later, he presented his platform to voters and won an electoral college majority and probably a popular vote majority. He may also bolster his legitimacy by becoming the first Republican president to win the popular vote since 2004. Yeah, again, the article's a little bit old, so it's still on track, probably likely. And again, definitely made, you know, bigger margins with every group. So, America has given us an unprecedented and powerful mandate. The former and future president said at his Mar-a-Lago victory party early Wednesday, Trump has denied that he wants autocratic power, saying his claim he'd be a dictator on day one is a joke, and that he is instead the savior of democracy. Apparently, people agree with what he said, okay? So, yet millions of Americans chose Trump after his extreme closing argument in which he proposed the biggest deportation operation in U.S. history, musing about using the military against enemies from within and vowed to prosecute political opponents and expel Haitian refugees in Ohio who are legally in the country and whom he falsely accused of eating people's pets. Whew. Wow, that's a sentence. That's a big, long run on sentence. That's impressive. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's a lot. Here, here, here's all the bad stuff. Come on, come on, come on. Why don't you hate this guy? Well, you're reading CNN, so you probably do hate this guy. Just get, you know, more some clicks. All right. Trump's willingness to wield unchecked executive power will not only be facilitated by his interpretation of the Supreme Court ruling on immunity. I mean, again, he either has that executive power or he doesn't. And it's up to the other branches of government to check and balance his power. He has already subverted constraints on presidential authority, his two impeachments over trying to coerce Ukraine with aid and the Capitol insurrection didn't rein in his impulses. Yeah. They, I, I don't know why you think they would have, you know, made him think, yeah, you know what, I really should have rethought these things. It just doesn't make sense. And the Republicans' refusal to convict him in the Senate showed the toothlessness of this crucial constitutional remedy when a political party has chosen to appease an extreme president in return for power. Well, apparently, some of those Republicans.
tokens. You know, yeah, you've got people that are going in and out, and you know what? If there is a good enough reason, I'm sure that they would have voted to convict him. But it seems like even half the Republicans in the Senate decided, yeah, no, these arguments are not worth merit. And apparently the American people agree with them. In Trump's first term, some Republicans sometimes hampered his agenda. Say, the late Arizona Senator John McCain, for instance, thwarted an attempt to overrun key provisions of the Affordable Care Act with his thumbs-down vote. But Trump ally Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene warned Wednesday that dissent would not be tolerated from GOP members. I will not let them, and neither will the American people who have given us this amazing opportunity to save this country, the Georgia Republican posted on X. Okay. So. I mean, it kind of sounds like you're saying everything's going to be on his side. So. That's bad because we don't want him to do the things that he said he's going to do. Okay, but again, that's kind of how democracy works if the other guy who is gonna, you know, do the things that you want gets elected with an overwhelming majority, you wouldn't want him to not do the things that he said he was gonna do, right? I understand that you disagree with it, but that is kind of just how democracy works when we have these, you know, sort of divides. Kinzinger scoffed at the idea that a GOP Congress would temper Trump. On paper, it's a real thing. In practice, no. The former Illinois lawmaker told CNN's Dana Bash Wednesday, there is no chance, 0.0 chance, that's a lot of certainty, that Donald Trump says something and Republicans in the House buck him anymore. Why? Why? Why wouldn't they do that? Why is there an absolute 100% certainty that there is no chance of that happening. Ah, uh, okay. Trump, by winning back the Oval Office, has also evaded the constraints of the law. So in addition to having the Supreme Court's immunity ruling in his back pocket, why would he be cowed by the possibility of future legal action against him? I mean, why wouldn't he? Yeah, assuming he thinks that some future legal action against him would stick, why wouldn't he? I mean, I think he would have the exact same reaction most of us would. This thing's illegal. I'll get prosecuted for it. I'll get sued for it. I shouldn't do it. You know, even just ignoring the morality of it. Yeah. Wouldn't the threat of future legal action be a detractor for him? Wouldn't it kind of maybe rein him in a little bit? And certainly people have shown they're more than happy to do it, so why not? Within hours of election night, special counsel Jack Smith was already talking with the Justice Department about ending two federal prosecutions against Trump over his efforts to subvert the 2020 election and his origin of classified documents in line with Office of Legal Counsel curbs on prosecution of sitting presidents. Right, I mean, that was, you know, that was, that was a big part of this election. Or at least the initial sort of parts of, you know, him being elected in the primary was... He's got to be elected president. If not, he's going to jail forever. A state election meddling case in Georgia is now imperiled, and huge doubts also hang over the pending sentencing of Trump after a conviction in a hush money case in New York. These are all certainly things that, if you absolutely believe that all of these cases were super serious, super real, and had absolutely
absolutely all of the evidence necessary to prove the claims and the legal standing to advance those claims, you might be worried. I can understand that. I can understand that. I would probably argue eh, that those court cases don't seem to have actually been all that serious, you know? Like, they seem like they were kind of wishy-washy. Hey, we're getting, you know, we can't get Al Capone for any of the real crimes that he committed. So we'll get him on tax evasion because we know he's such a bad guy. Okay. Kind of unsatisfying. And apparently, again, the majority of the electorate believed, nah, these things aren't that serious. They're not so serious that they should, you know, bar this person from public life forever. Yeah. The danger is very real. The scope for Trump to stretch historic interpretations of his executive power is immense. Sure, possibilities are always possible. The danger is very real, said Corey Brett Schneider, professor of politics at Brown University and author of the book, The Presidents and the People, Five Leaders Who Threatened Democracy and the Citizens Who Fought to Defend It. Brett Snyder cited Revolutionary War hero Patrick Henry's disquiet about the possibility that the office of the presidency was so powerful that an incumbent with authoritarian ambitions could ascend an American throne. While the founders modeled the presidency on the persona of George Washington, Brett Schneider explained that Henry proposed this hypothetical. What if a bad person gets in that office, or even a criminal president? And his point is, you know these supposed checks because they assume a virtuous person. They're pretty weak. I mean, again, I remember from my high school government class that there's kind of a lot of checks and balances in the Constitution. That's kind of the whole point of it. So it's sort of up to the politicians who have those powers to overrule the presidency to use those powers. If, however, you think, you know what, actually this thing is not really all that popular, um, and therefore getting together the political will to check the president is not going to get me elected, gosh, you know what, I don't want to do it then. If that's the case, and you don't care enough about other people's well-being to dethrone an American tyrant, and you'd rather have your cushy Washington job, then you probably shouldn't be in office any more than anybody else. So, I mean, you know, look yourself in the mirror, maybe. Trump has plenty of models for his second term. He has frequently praised foreign autocrats like Russian President Vladimir Putin and China's Xi Jinping, who face no democratic accountability. I, I, I know I keep hearing that, and I suppose I believe it, but I don't know if he's praising them for, you know, political reasons, in the sense of like, hey, I have to do business with these people. Why not, you know, get in a good relationship with them and then, you know, screw them at the table, screw them at the negotiating table? That, that's kind of reasonable. I don't know if he loves the fact that, you know what, I want to have a China, you know, I want to have a Russian-type government system. He admires the rule of his friend, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, who has eroded institutions of accountability, including government departments, the court system, and the press. Some people don't like him because he's too strong. It's good to have a strong man at the head of a country, Trump reflected at a rally in New Hampshire in January. Okay. Uh, he's not... I mean, that doesn't really... He's not... Trump's not saying he's glad that he, you know destroyed all these institutions of accountability. He 
He's just saying, I like the guy. He's strong. Could mean the bad thing that you're insinuating, but, you know, it's not really him saying that for sure. Trump's conception of the presidency was encapsulated by his statement in July 2019 that the Constitution gave him untamed power. I have an Article 2 where I have to the right to do whatever I want as president. He said, Article 2 lays out the duties of the presidency, but it does not, in conventional interpretations at least, suggest blanket executive authority. That's an interesting statement. Um, I don't know exactly what you mean there. Does that mean that, okay, you as the president, you're the chief executive officer, you actually don't have the ability to do everything in your duty as, you know, the chief executive? Somebody else has to come in and, like, tell you, no, 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 you can't do that. I I'm going to tell you what to do. It kind of feels like if you have the top job for a company, you have the top job at that company. Yeah. Trump's attitude moved then-federal judge Katanji Brown-Jackson to remark in a 2019 ruling which ordered compliance by former White House counsel Don McGahn with a congressional subpoena that the primary takeaway from the past 250 years of recorded American history is that presidents are not kings. Yeah, they've got checks and balances. They are not the only, you know, form of government. And, I mean, we still have that. So, we've got a president, not a king, still. It's just kind of the point. It will take time to rein in Trump. So, are there any constraints? The greatest inhibition to presidential overreach is the sitting president himself. Yeah. That's never been a, a real inhibition here. Again, past 30, 40, 50 years, have we really had presidents that are really holding themselves back? Or are they always reaching for more? They're reaching for more. Spoiler. Who can choose to accept within bounds of accepted executive? Who chose? Who can chose? Who can choose? CNN, editor, come on. Choose to remain within bounds of accepted executive action. But self-restraint is a concept alien to Trump. This is not just a personal trait. It sounds like a personal trait. Such conduct is endemic to his political appeal. And he was just elected by millions of voters who endorsed his promise to eviscerate a governing system that they believe has failed them. Okay. If they believe it's failed them, then they probably believe that for a decent reason, and maybe it has failed them. And when other people were talking about burning down a system of government that, you know, sounded bad or some, you know, institution, people were all for it. In the past, Trump has sometimes been loath to take steps that might make him politically unpopular. Yet, he will take office knowing he does not have to appeal to voters ever again since he's in his second term. That's true of all lame duck presidents. The most effective clamp on, and I will also say, that's kind of a good portion of why people like the idea of term limits. If you're not constantly running for office, and you don't always have to, you know, worry about what's going to get you reelected. you can do the hard political maneuvering and the things that actually get things done that might, you know, hurt you running again. So, I mean, yeah, he's not looking for another job in politics. Kind of good. He's not looking for a cushy private sector consultancy job after this because he's already got money, so that's good. I mean, yeah, I think you should probably always have politicians that are not worried about being reelected. I think that's kind of a good thing, which is, again, an argument for term limits. The most effective clamp on Trump's future power would be a Democratic House majority, which could challenge the new White House.
House with the power of oversight, even if Trump has already mocked the ultimate sanction of impeachment. But with races still outstanding, Republicans are closer to the 218 seats needed for the majority than Democrats. Again, article's a little bit old. It's pretty much a lockdown deal. Republicans have the majority. Then there are the courts. Activist groups are sure to lodge cases against Trump's immigration moves, as happened over his ban on travelers from certain Muslim nations in his first term. Such maneuvers can tie up a president for months. Although the scores of Trump-appointed judges and the conservative Supreme Court majority may give the administration reprieves. Okay. Attempts to prosecute Trump's political foes on spurious grounds, meanwhile, could hang on. Attempts to prosecute Trump's political foes on spurious grounds, meanwhile, could theoretically see mass resignations of Justice Department staff. Okay. This is one reason why the new administration may roll out plans to sack entire echelons of the civil service to ensure total loyalty to the new president. So, they'll resign if you don't fire them. You have to fire them so that they won't resign. Okay, and it's also an interesting way to sort of go, hey, look, uh, we're not cutting back on government bureaucracy and red tape and a bloated managerial class because it's good for the country. It's, it's for loyalty. Okay. And the former president is unlikely to make his first term mistake of appointing officials who confront him, like former Chief of Staff John Kelly and former Defense Secretary Mark Esper. Okay. I mean... I don't remember a lot of people in Biden's administration really super confronting and stopping him doing stuff. And I think that's generally speaking what normally happens when you get a new president is they kind of appoint officials who help them out. That's why they're there. Brett Schneider argues in his book published this year that an authoritarian president would not present a hopeless situation for U.S. democracy. See? Obvious. And again, that's my argument. Even if you've got an authoritarian president, which we've had many times in the past, let's be totally honest here, and we still have a system of democratic governance and power swings between the executive, the legislative, and the judicial all throughout American history, we're in a period of super high executive power, I would expect it to switch, to swing. He examines five commanders in chief who threaten democracy and shows how they spawned protest movements, citizen activism, and eventually democratic victories that created restorative presidencies. Say nothing but good stuff. Still, such responses can't often halt presidential acts in their commission meaning that the fate of the country and its democracy often hinges on the president himself. The founders weren't sitting there in the Constitutional Convention and looking at Washington, and they thought to themselves, this is a person of virtue. That's who they had as a model in mind. When you have somebody who's not a model of virtue, they can really wreak havoc. I fundamentally disagree. They had just overthrown a king. They were clearly aware that human beings are not angels. And therefore, you need to create a system of government that accounts for the vices in the nature of human beings. And therefore, you need to create a system that guards against those baser instincts and darker forces. That is why they're there. They would say, hey, it's great if we have a person of virtue sitting in the presidency, and we hope to create a system that engenders them rising to the top and being our political class. Obviously, that's not the case now, but ideally. However, they're aware that politicians often become politicians forever. And they are going, hey, we need to rein that
that stuff in if that is the case. So, yeah, I, I fundamentally disagree with that, to be perfectly honest. The guardrails are there to make sure that a president does not become a king, and it hasn't happened yet. Again, I will reserve judgment. I don't think it's going to happen, but if it starts to happen, and there's no pushback from any other side, well, I'll make a video, and you can tell me I'm wrong. And I'll be the first person to say, hey, look, we need to stop this. We need smaller government. The president needs to be less powerful. The government needs to be less powerful. And I'm firmly of that opinion currently. Absolutely. I would love to see all the branches of government be less powerful and less impactful in our lives. With that being said, thank you for your time and attention. I hope you enjoyed this. Good luck in all your endeavors. And I believe I shall say farewell.